and thank you for joining me. Today we're going to be doing something a little bit different. So recently, I came across a packet of over 200 documents from Graceland from the late 80s. This packet was submitted by Elvis Presley Enterprises as an application to the National Register of Historic Places and Landmarks, where they give a description of the entire property in detail. All of this is public domain and scanned in online, so I'm not sharing anything here that's private. But reading these pages, I learned so much about the house itself, so I compiled everything that I found interesting in a sort of tour to share with you. So we will discuss the history of Graceland, as well as an in-depth peek at the layout from the gates to the attic. Let's get started. Graceland wasn't always the name of a house. In the 1800s, the Tooth family owned a 500 acre farm, which is now the community of Whitehaven. Stephen Tooth named the farm after his daughter Grace and left the property to his granddaughter, Ruth Brown Moore, and her husband, Dr. Thomas Moore. Grace was Ruth's aunt. Ruth and Thomas built the house in 1939 in classical revival style. They decorated with hardwood floors, oriental rugs, and European antiques. Ruth and Thomas's daughter, Ruth Marie, another Marie, was a musical prodigy who played with the Memphis Symphony Orchestra and played harp and piano in the front three rooms of the house. Now the house was actually designed with their daughter's musical talents in mind. The architects designed the entire front of the house to seat up to 500 people for a concert. So who were these architects? The architectural firm Furbringer and Ehrman, comprised of Max Furbringer and Merrill Ehrman, didn't actually make a lot of residential homes at all. They are actually known for several public structures still standing today, some even Elvis-related, like the Overton Park Shell, now the Levitt Shell, where Elvis performed in 1954, and they also designed the Mid-South Coliseum. Isn't that crazy? I wonder if Elvis knew that his beloved home was created by the designers of the pregnant pancake, as he called it. Now, let's talk about the property across the street before moving on to the house. So when Elvis purchased Graceland, it was all green space across the street, and that's what he enjoyed. He liked being able to look out the window and just see nature. He even purchased a huge chunk of it, but never did anything with it maybe to prevent it from becoming a concrete jungle. So in 1962, Elvis purchased the right side of the museum, where the airplanes are standing today and then the parking lot behind it. In the 1960s, a strip mall was built directly across the street from Graceland, and after Elvis died, they all kind of became tacky souvenir shops. In 1978, Vernon sold off Elvis's two airplanes, but when it opened as a museum, Graceland brought them home literally, and they've been sitting in that same place since 1984. Elvis Presley Enterprises bought up all of the stores in the strip mall in 1983, but honored their individual leases until they expired in 1987. That's when the museum expanded into the original complex that we knew and loved, and then now the new complex. Now back across the street. The current guard shack that is there now, the one made of brick, replaced an old wooden one in 1971. Now, my friend John Daly and I think it was replaced sooner than that in the late 60s, but that's what these documents say. Graceland's windows have a diamond-shaped metal grid over them for security added by Elvis in the 1960s. What I call the annex, the moors originally used as a four-car garage. Now, Elvis converted this space into an apartment and several of his family and friends lived there. The Lackers, Charlie Hodge, and Vernon Presley used it at various points of his life, including at the end of his life, when he needed to be on the first floor. When the house opened for tours, this garage apartment was used for office space. In the basement den with the TCB lightning bolt and three TVs was sort of a study for the Moors. They didn't really use this space, but kept a library and a piano in it. Across the hall where there's a pool table now was also a game room for the Moors, but they played ping pong and darts. Now up to the jungle room. The famous waterfall was built with cut field stone by Marty Lacker's brother-in-law, Bernard Grenadier, I'm not sure if I'm saying it right, in the 1960s. On the opposite wall is a set of stairs that continues the green shag carpet upstairs. This staircase leads to the sun deck, which you can see from outside, and it is above the jungle room. You know that large opening in the wall you stand at to admire the jungle room? That wasn't always there. A huge hole in the wall was cut out for tours in 1982. 
Originally, the upstairs landing used to overlook downstairs, but is now totally enclosed with walls, a door, and mirrored windows. Elvis added these likely for privacy and noise. The description remarked that this hallway's moldings are in a neoclassical revival style. Now, upon entering the hallway, on the left is a set of double doors that leads to Elvis's office that the Moors originally used as a bedroom. Elvis's office walls have button tufted gold padding and the perimeter of the ceiling is a trough for indirect lighting and red neon. This office is also where the ladies of Elvis's life had their own private bathroom with pink appliances and a large closet. Moving on to Lisa's bedroom. I'm not sure if this was always there, but her bedroom does have a mini kitchen inside, which I thought was pretty interesting. Graceland's attic is full size and unfinished and has two large cedar closets. Now going outside, there are three trailers left behind from the Elvis years, one regular size and two double wide. As of the late 80s, one was used as an office, one as an employee break lounge, and one for the home of the head of maintenance. Don't worry, I saved the best for last. Now we'll talk about Elvis's bedroom. So remember that set of double doors that lead to Elvis's office on the left? Well, if you take a right, there is another set of padded double doors that lead to Elvis's bedroom. He had a massive double king size bed with two TVs installed into the ceiling above, which was made of padded gold glitter button tufted vinyl. I couldn't remember that. There is a small closet on the other side of the bed. The south wall and west wall, the one that faces the front of the house, are wallpapered in black with imitation velvet strips. His bathroom is decorated in black and red with mirrored walls just like downstairs. In 1991, their requests were approved and Graceland was placed on the National Register of Historic Places. And that is it. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Thank you so much for watching and please subscribe for more adventures. No, seriously, subscribe. It's free. Click the button right here, I'll wait. And hit the bell while you're at it.